The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. Hey everyone, really excited to be with you today. I have some pretty cool news at the end of this episode, so definitely stick around for that. But to hop right into this one, I found a couple fantastic examples of what not to do um, as a parent or teacher that I thought were really helpful and meaningful. And they actually come from E.M. Standing, who is Maria Montessori's biographer, or one of Maria Montessori's biographers, and a good friend. So he's no longer around for sure. Uh, but I want to share these two examples with you. And they're both about maybe stepping in with a young child when you shouldn't be or saying something with a young child that you probably shouldn't be saying. So I'm going to share those two examples. And then I'm going to hop into an example of my own where I kind of put a little bit more confidence in the children that I was working with uh, years ago and what a success that was. So kind of some contrast here. Um, so the first one is E.M. Standing. I'm going to call this the interrupted scientist. And again, this comes from E.M. Standing. Here we go. Perhaps at this point, a few examples might help to make clear what Montessori means by failing to respect the inner life of the child. I remember standing one day outside a little shop in Salzburg, but it might just as well have been any other town in any other country. A well-dressed lady had gone inside to make some purchases, leaving her little girl, aged about four, on the pavement outside. Close by to where the little girl was standing was a circular trap door set in the pavement presumably covering a place to put coal in. It consisted of a circular piece of metal covered with a great number of very tiny knobs, causing it to have a rough surface, whereas the surface of the surrounding pavement was smooth. The child bent down and, with an air of great concentration, began slowly and carefully drawing the tips of her fingers now over the rough surface, now over the smooth. Again and again she repeated this movement, she was in fact making a comparative study of the two kinds of surfaces exactly as the children do in the well-known Montessori tactile exercise called rough and smooth. Um, side note, in these rough and smooth tablets in a Montessori classroom or environment, there'll be one tablet that's very smooth and then one tablet that's rough, maybe some sandpaper on it, and a child will be blindfolded and he's touching each one to kind of get a sense of the contrast between them. There's a whole reason for this, but it's really developing the senses of a child. I'm not going to jump into that, but that's what he's referring to. Okay, back to E.M. Standing. She was still absorbed in this genuinely scientific experiment when her mother emerged from the shop. You dirty little thing, she exclaimed in a tone of disgust. Fancy rubbing your hands on the pavement. Saying when she seized the little girl's hand, that delicate tendril of the opening mind, and gave it a resounding smack after which she crossly dragged her away from the place, as if from the plague. I shall not readily forget the expression on the little one's face as the mother smacked it. Even so might Pasteur have looked if, while absorbed in the study of his serums, his wife had suddenly entered and whacked him across the head with a rolling pin. Okay, so E.M. Stanley is talking about Louis Pasteur, who was a French chemist and bi microbiologist. He was a guy, if you don't know him, researched and made huge discoveries in they say the causes and maybe preventions of diseases, hugely responsible for a lot of what we have as modern medicine today. Anyway, she's making the analogy there, like you're deeply engaged in some real thoughtful work and somebody just smacks you out of it. And I mean, in this way, disparagingly, like what you're up to is no good, it's dirty. So what Stanning is getting at here is that sometimes what we think a child is doing it's wrong or bad he's actually or she is actually doing something pretty profound and deep. Like in this case, she's looking at the contrast. It's like a little scientist. Um, and now it's the interrupted scientist. Uh, now, I'm sure this happens similarly. I don't know how many parents are out there smacking their kids in the hands, but definitely over concern about germs and dirtiness, which is kind of ironic given it's he mentions Pasteur. But anyhow, um, 
generally speaking, let's be on the lookout for stepping back, observing the situation first. Is my child just making a mess and throwing dirt all over the place, like at people's faces or something, which obviously would be a problem? Or is he just experimenting, looking at it? And how dirty is the environment we're in? Like, are we in a dog park and there's dog poop everywhere? And my child's like, ooh, I like the hard poop versus the small, the soft poop. Clearly, that's a problem. But maybe on the street corner, like, okay, as long as you're there, right? Yeah, she's, she's feeling around. Afterwards, we can use some wipes and clean it up, you know? Like, so let's take a breath and chill out. Um, in the classroom, similar, similar situations, right? Okay, the next example that's about this idea, again, of just stepping back, observing first before judging the situation, before acting, um, having a little bit more respect or confidence in the child's ability to um, say, hey, I'm doing something important here, you know, if, if he or she could speak at the young age. So this one I'm calling the miniature mountaineer uh, or Superman. Okay, here's EM standing again. Here's another example of a more tragic kind because the trouble in this case actually arose from a praiseworthy desire to help the child instead of thwarting it. A small toddler set out slowly and laboriously to climb up the stairs, an accomplishment she had only very recently acquired. She had succeeded in climbing up three or four steps when her nursemaid seized her and carried her right up to the top. Thereupon, the child immediately began to get agitated and to cry loudly. This happened a number of times, always with the same result. The child began to cry when the nursemaid came to its assistance. This latter well-meaning but not very perceptive individual did not realize that what was fascinating the child was not reaching the top of the stairs, but the process of getting there, the difficult and exciting feat of conquering those, for her, gigantic steps. Deprived of the joy of this effort, she had felt as a rock-climbing mountaineer would feel if, just after he had set out to ascend the Matterhorn, an angel were to transport him suddenly to the distant summit. So here, we, you know, he's talking about a lesson in Montessori that's it's such a deep and profound and big one, but it's hard to really internalize, but that so much of the child's work is about the process, not the end result. So this child enjoys the process of getting up the steps, where to us, it's like, hey, dude, we just want to get to the top quick. As fast as possible, let's get there. Um, the child loves the process. So there's so many ways in which we can interfere with what the child is doing. Here, let me help you with that. Oh, oh do you need any help? And you just jump in. So we need to be very careful about jumping in to help a child when they don't need this. Uh, interestingly, it's not just children. Um, it's wild because when I, I gave a talk once and I remember sharing this example and, and a woman that was there, she said how, or maybe it was the husband who shared the, the wife story, but whatever the case, the, the woman had been on an airplane and she was getting her bag up to the top and somebody had come by and go, oh, let me get that for you and helped her. And she actually was offended by it. So, I mean, I was kind of shocked when she told this story or the husband told the story because I thought, well, the guy's just trying to be kind and help. But the question was, well, did that woman actually need it? So we have to be very observant of the person. So sometimes you should, if you're being observant, you should realize, oh yeah, I can tell this woman's looking around. She's, you know, she's kind of seeking help versus a confident individual putting up their bag, man, man or female, like you wouldn't need to help. Um, it actually made me start thinking about elderly people in a different way. Um, this example and just Montessori in general that we tend to think like, what's the, what's the sweetest thing you can think of? Well, hope it, helping an old woman or man across the street. And it's, it's weird because I always had that as like, oh, that's a positive. But we really need to ask ourselves, is that older gentleman or older woman asking for our help? Is, are they showing signs of a need for help? Because if not, then we're running over there. Oh, let me help you across the street. And, you know, if I had a cane, I might be like, why don't you get the hell away from me? I don't need your help. I appreciate it. But you keep on walking there, young buck. You know, like, so anyways, point is, let's be very observant of if there's a need um, of our aid in the moment, um, which takes a lot of practice. You know, I don't, I don't want to guilt anybody here. It takes a lot of practice. It took me, I don't know, 20 years. And I'm still going at it, you know, which brings me to my story. 
uh, my story is a positive story. I, I did a successful thing, yeah. Uh, but it came on the, what do you say, on the footsteps or on the, I don't know what that saying is. But anyways, it came after a lot of errors and mess ups on my part. So I used to teach elementary and junior high school, relatively traditional, but I was a kind of, you know, somewhat of a radical teacher. So I wasn't like I was up there just boringly lecturing at kids. But what we would often do is we'd have a discussion or a lecture, and these were these were fun times. Um, almost all the children would be engaged. Every now and again, it might be somebody who was not, but generally speaking, children really enjoyed this. But what they some of them did not enjoy was the work afterwards, and the work I would give them was always the same, like the always same assignment, like oh, you got to solve. Everybody in the class has to have to answer these three questions, or everybody in the class has to write this one essay. So it was the same for every child, regardless of their unique interests, their unique abilities. It was like fifth graders all should be able to do this assignment. It was a long time ago, so give me a break. Um, but what I I was you know getting more and more into Montessori. I was observing more and more downstairs in these Montessori classrooms that were connected to this school. So with three to six year olds and then toddlers, I was more and more seeing that these little kids had more independence than the children I was working with that were much much older. And I started to integrate some of it into my own classrooms. And so one, I'm just going to give you this example. One day I was teaching a fifth grade class and we were doing ancient Greece. This was during one of the units um, in history. And I, we had a great day. Like we, you know, we were discussing what was going on at this time period. You know, it's probably a little bit of the gods. You know, they had these ancient Greek gods back then. Some of the politics back then, very, you know, I'm not talking about like depth in politics, but just what democracy was back then. Uh, Socrates, just some fun but basic uh, elements of the history. And after the lesson was done or after our discussion was done, what I normally would do was hand out some work or some assignment to every child, the same exact thing, you know, maybe a worksheet. And what I did today because of this Montessori influence is I said, you know, to myself, I'm like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let them do a follow up activity that they come up with and not completely. I want to give them a little bit of guidance because, you know, complete, just do whatever you want can turn into just as big of a mess as telling every child they must do exactly the same thing. Uh, so what I did is I said, you know, guys, I know I give you the same, as, uh, uh, you know, everybody gets the same assignment. Usually what I'm going to do today is you come up with what you would like to do based on what we've just learned or what we've learned in the last few weeks in ancient uh, Greece. And I gave a, a couple examples, maybe like you could do a drawing or, you know, if you want to make a, um, a shield, an ancient Greek shield. Uh, or you can do like an alternative history assignment, like what happens if, you know, Sparta had actually beaten Athens in a war early or, you know, all sorts of different examples. And I said, go at it, guys. Now, I don't want to make it seem like fantasy and everybody was immediately engaged in work and everything went over tremendously well on that first day. Uh, there were a few, a couple kids that they need a little extra guidance. They come up and ask for help and, and then I would give it because they asked me for that help. Uh, but so many of the children were so deeply engaged in the work. It was, I, I sat back and go, oh my God, they would just, they were pumped. Like every now and again, there'd be an assignment that was really fun and kids would get into it, but not with this type of just, just focus and excitement. And everybody was doing something different. You know, it was, it was incredible, but I'm going to share with you because I've kept this all these years. One example of the work that came out of this, just, you know, me experimenting with, Hey, let's have a little bit more respect, a little bit of more confidence in children. Um, so one of the children named Andrew, he was actually younger than the rest. So I think he was, so he was probably nine where most of the other children were 10 at the time. It's a fifth grade class. He did a journal entry of an Athenian man at the time. Random journal, like I'm in a journal in my little notebook and whatever they were writing on back then, um, a scroll, who knows? And he did it. So here's just a few sentences from the beginning. A day in Athens. Ah, I wake up in my sheep wool bed. I walk over to my clothes stand. I grab my toga and dash outside so fast I think it would have been a gift from Hermes. I ran over to the Acropolis to do my daily sacrifice. After that, I went to the Agora to get more cheese and bread. I would get more figs tomorrow. I thought about how terrible Sparta was. Oh, what a horrifying place. I should not think about this now, though. Oh, gods of Olympia, my meeting. 
I'm late. And then he goes on and on. I mean, through all these different things, it's so, and you know, you see there's references to all sorts of different, you know, knowledge, historical information about Athens in there. It's just, oh, I loved it. And, you know, at this point, I was beyond writing, great job, good job, or like A plus on this. I wrote at the end here, like literally have it here. I can't wait for the next installment, Andrew. So that was the feedback I gave him. So this kid was just enthralled with the work and it came from him, from in, internal excitement um, with a little guidance from me, but generally this is his. So it's just one of those things for me and my development from kind of more of a traditional style to you know, Montessori, like really looking at it and observing what do these children need? What are they, what do they need at this age, at this developmental period? What is this individual child like? What is she like versus this other boy in the classroom? Um, just a lot more observing of children, a lot more thinking about their needs and a lot more uh, confidence in, hey, they can achieve things. And so that was my little story, uh, A Day in Athens with uh, Andrew, Ancient Greece. Now, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you know, I'm not just sharing my story to be like, look how amazing I am versus these other two individuals who just completely messed up. Uh, But more so to just share a few different kind of anecdotes with you of situations in the real world in which, you know, we can mess up. You know, we can get angry at a child for basically being a little scientist, you know, or we can aid a child when she's not asking for any help. Or we can do something really cool and offer children some choices and they can come up with some creative, incredible stuff that's like, wow, I had no idea that was coming. So that's really all I wanted to share with you. I don't have any deep kind of integrating, this is Montessori, you know, to to put out there. But I just want to share these cool little stories that I found uh, pretty impactful and I hope you do as well. Uh, Now on to that Quick point, and this is really from my old school listeners who have been around for a while. I want to apologize. I've been hiding something from you guys. Uh, And the reason I have been hiding this is because I've learned over the years to not talk too much about something that you're up to or planning before you do it because you can get hyped up and you don't get moving. Well, in this case, it's not just me, but my wife and I have been planning something super significant. So I think I've mentioned that I've recently, actually not too recently now, it's almost a year ago, but I moved to South Florida about an hour and a half above Miami. Uh, For those of you who don't know, my wife is from Venezuela. Uh, Hablamos Español, so both of us speak Spanish. She speaks a lot better than I do. I'm still working on it. Um, But just to say that we love South Florida. We love, um, we came here because we like the humidity unlike other people who don't. but So we love the weather, love the beach. Um, that's what really drew us here. But this is kind of tangential. What I want to tell you is we were in the midst and purposefully going to purchase a school or rent a building and start our own Montessori school. So I haven't talked a lot about you know deep past of mine, but I uh, was a teacher for years, but I also ran schools for years and then helped to develop different schools across the country. And My wife has been a Montessori teacher for almost 10 years, uh, mainly three to six, but has worked with toddlers and also been a nanny for a long time. And we got to talking and at some point we knew we got to create our own thing. That's, that was the end goal. I didn't talk much about this on the podcast, but I'm sharing it with you. So we moved to South Florida to plan to open our own school. As things would have it, we had, we knew we were having a baby, Ragnar. And as we thought a lot more about this, it just hit me and her that it's not really what we want for our child in the kind of traditional, even traditional Montessori school classroom. Not that it's bad, but it's not what we wanted. So what we did was we purchased a house with an acre, beautiful location. I mean, just room to run around. The actual house is a remodeled mid-century home. We've got wraparound windows, literally just you look out the windows and you're out in nature. Palm trees, pine trees, grass, green, cows. <laughs> Your neighbor has some cows. So it's just been a wonderful experience. And we've been building up this house so that we could run a very small Montessori homeschool. 
Um, I'm calling it a schoolhouse because I don't like to think of homeschool as kind of like, oh, I'm just chilling with my kids in the house. Like that's definitely not what's happening here. So it's a very, very unique environment. We have a couple people that are signed up already, but we have a few spaces because I have not made this public yet. This is the first time I'm speaking about it. So for the old school listeners out there, I wanted to tell you first, if any of you live in South Florida, feel free to reach out. You probably know my email, but I'll put it out. Jesse, J-E-S-S-E at MontessoriEducation.com. And you can check out the site that I just got up. It is La Casa, because that's the name of this place, La Casa, the home um, or the house, La Casa fl.com so hop on check it out i want to be very upfront about this we deliberately chose where this school is um, we deliberately are having it small so i want to tell everybody out there's very limited spaces the max this will ever get ever ever is 10 so if you're excited about this and you reach out, just know that this there's no way I can guarantee any everybody getting in and so forth. It's it's just the nature of what we're creating for our own child and for uh, local families. That's what I got for you. Um, again, I apologize for not sharing the kind of whole journey and maybe in later episodes, I'll share some of the experience because it's been a blast. I mean, I've been learning so much on how to, even building around the house. We've got an acre now and most of our lives, you know, we were living in apartments. So, you know, if you had a problem, you called somebody up and say, hey, can you fix this? And they just come right up. Here? Oh man, it's been wild. It's been a, oh, such a, such a joy. But anyhow, that was the secret or the exciting thing to let you know. Um, I hope the stories in the beginning of this episode were helpful. Uh, I love them myself as I learned about them or read them and then experienced them. And uh, that's what I got for you today. As always, you know, I'm Jess McCarthy. You can find me at MontessoriEducation.com. Um, tell your friends about the show if you haven't already. Tell your neighbors. Um, tell your grandma. Tell everybody. Let's, let's spread the good life for more and more children out there and uh, young and old. So, you know, the, the real children and then the children at heart. Um, and then shoot me a comment whenever you want. Um, leave a review. Just do what you can to spread the good word, as I'm saying. All right, guys. Uh, always fun being with you. I hope all is well in your lives. And uh, take care.